pyramids, stools, triangles, to act, indicator, people, planet, profit, cross-curricular, happiness, inter, multi, and transdisciplinary, education, participants, target groups, action learning, values, attitude, morality, connection, future, learning, unlearning, emergent, dynamic, crisis, social action, wisdom, deep immersion, empathy, love, harmony, knowing, understanding, experience, experiential learning, motivation, mindfulness, peace, beauty, integral, leadership, transition, hope, optimism, progress, climate change, footprint, responsibility, ownership, holistic, systemic, bottom-up, reflecting, senses, trust, relationships, diversity, multi-perspectivity, emancipatory, democracy, transformative, innovation, healing, resilience, inclusive, competences, tipping points, co-creating, diverge, disrupt, appreciation, complexity, social learning, ethics, whole school approach, community, radical change, a great leap forward. So these are some of the words that we have been using so effortlessly uh, and we do on these conferences. Uh, but what do they actually mean? Aryan yesterday referred to the danger of sustainable development becoming an empty concept um, where it means so many things that it stops meaning anything and business taking advantage of that by calling things sustainable that are not sustainable at all. And I think that as ESD researchers and educators, we are also guilty of that. So we also use these words, but actually um, we don't really show what they actually mean. So every time I come to an ESD conference, I am struck by how little we say actually reflects what ESD is. So I'm bombarded with concepts and terms, but there's very little evidence of these words in the delivery itself. Shown on a slide in an airtight room, they just become abstract concepts, stripped away from their lived meaning. And, well, let's be honest, uh, giving these words a color or arranging them in a word cloud is not going to change the fact that they're just words on a slide. We look ourselves up in these buildings, uh, underground, airtight, um, and we're a bit like this poor little plant in this glass bowl. We all come together and we huddle together under the glass very comfortably, and we look outside as if everything should be happening there. And then we pass back and forth these words that actually stop meaning. We know them so well, but when we just speak them, they don't mean anything anymore. And I don't think that we do these words justice if they're spoken in these ways, if we don't show the evidence of what they actually mean. When the word experiential, me experiential learning is uttered in an environment that is entirely stripped of any experience, when we talk about heart, hands and head, when all we do is use our head. Should we, should we use these words at all if they're removed from the practice and the place and the time where they matter, where they attain their meaning from? And it really baffles me every time when I come to an ESD conference that you've got all these extremely passionate, creative and empathic experts of ESD but we all do the same thing. We all revert about ESD as something happening out there, away from us, instead of right here with us and in us. Um, where ESD is bolted on instead of integrated wholly with everything we do, how we deliver our lectures, how we speak, 
and how we have our coffees in the break. And why do we do that? Why do we as ESD teachers, educators and researchers, why do we feel that we need to organize conferences in the same abstracted, objectified and disenchanted way as everyone else does? Aren't we perpetuating the same unsustainability by talking about sustainability in ways that are generated that generated our disconnected position to the world in the first place. Where theory is divided from practice, where we divide between experts and non-experts. So I get to stand here, I'm the expert. You get to sit there and be quiet, so you're the non-expert. Where I get to speak, I get to act. I'm the actor and you're the spectator. You have to sit quietly, and you just have to consume knowledge. So I, get, I take the liberty to fill you as an empty vessel. Where the conversation is one way from me to you, and where you allow me to use all these words, half of which are empty, but it doesn't matter at all because in a minute we'll have a coffee break, we'll have a piece of cake, and everything will be fine. Why do we do that? I just, I really, I don't understand. Is it because... Others won't take us seriously if we don't organize the conferences in the same way as they do. Well, if that's the system that we want to change, then we shouldn't care and we should go for it. Or is it because we just haven't found a different way of doing things? We haven't found the alternative. I don't believe that either because, look, here you are. You're all experts in ESD. You're all catalysts and change makers. So I think we could, we're capable of doing this. So don't get me wrong. Um, I don't mean to slate this conference. I'm just as guilty of abstraction um, as people, other people are in, in the field of ESD. Because when somebody asks me to explain what sustainable development means, then I start using really big concepts and vague terms and I just see somebody's eyes glaze over and I know that I've lost them. And I'm an academic and my mind, my academic mind, really likes to abstract. It likes to put things in bowls like this, look at them, tidy them up, into neat little categories or into spotless linear structures so that I can see cause and effect. I like to order things, this complex world, into um, or summarize them into big concepts that seem to say everything but actually don't mean anything. But I think that we can do better than that and I think we should do better than that if we really want to change anything. So I've been devoting a lot of my professional life to find how we can do that, how we can give sustainable development a lived meaning. And that's what I want to share with you today. So I'm not, I am going to talk about all these terms that I just mentioned, but I'm not going to explain the meaning. I'm just going to talk about how we might give them meaning at all, how we can make sure that they are re-enchanted, that they start to matter again. And what I'm proposing is that we bring ESD home, that we bring it back to the personal, the lived and the emotional experience of people and ourselves and in everything that we do, so that we save it from the greedy hands of objectivism that strips any concept from its lived meaning. So the first thing that I would like to propose that I think we can do, is ditch the expert. So that's me. I'm not the only expert here. You're all teachers, experts in education. You're all fathers, mothers, grandfathers, neighbors, families. You're all experts in teaching, in uh, changing nappies, in feeding, in caring, in loving. You're all experts in living. You're all experts in being a human being. And that's what ESD is about. It's all about how we can live on this world in a good way. So um, let's do that. Uh, let's 
ditch the expert. And uh, inspired by yesterday, um, and after a few hours of rigorous contemplation, um, I came up with a model, very simple. It's called PPDD. And, um, well, who of you folded an airplane yesterday at the museum? Anybody? You did? did you? Well, yeah. What I'd like you to do, so the first step of the model is play. Fold a paper airplane. I've got some paper here, if you don't have one. And uh, can I have, um, there must be somebody in the room who used to be really good at folding airplanes. Yes, right, okay, can you, just for the people that have never done this, they've never sort of, or maybe just fold a very good one, could you show everyone how do to do want, this? Do you want the fancy one or you want the uh, no, flying I, let, No, let's have a, well, I definitely want a flying one, not just fancy. Who needs paper? I should, I should give a donation for you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, if, you don't, if you don't have your own design, you can start by, by folding the paper this way, which is uh, not uh, very traditional, but if you start folding it this way, and then, um, and then actually continue. Wait, 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 you need to wait because they are not yes. finished yet. Yeah, they, they don't have papers yet. Sorry, I'm... You're too well, excited. I'm, I'm so excited, you know. See, he's so excited to play. Absolutely. Well done. Absolutely. Fold, folding is fun. You, you fold uh, pieces together, then you open them up again as if, as if, as if you have done nothing. Um, so the next move actually would be to fold the paper the other way again, open it up and fold the other one the other way again. But, and it doesn't matter where exactly. I, I, I try to do about one third, but it doesn't really matter. It's not so important. And then put it together. So basically one third this way, about one third. You fold it this way, then you put it together. And then further on, a table would help. I don't have a table, so I tried. And now, you, now we start to, to, to make an airplane, as, as you might have previously. Try to do something like this. You have to turn it around, because they and can't see. Just fold it uh, together, so uh, uh, we are starting to form the wings now. And that would be the nose here. And again, uh, you don't have to uh, have the exact place here or, or something. Um, try to have the other wing as well. And now, it's, now a symmetry would help. If you can do it symmetrical, like this. Oh. Don't throw it yet. <laughs> Playing starts in a minute. You have to make so another one So in the end, out. we will have something like this. And now... <laughs> That's a, okay. You you continue, please. <laughs> you had a good. And now the next thing is if you if you have something like this. Just turn it hand, around a minute. Yeah. Yes. Now fold it together. And now your final move of the wings is is to fold fold the the wing uh, so that you put together the edges. The edge you have up here. You put uh, to the central line, and now you have your plane. If I did it correctly, I don't know. It's been a long time. Too long. Too long. How's everyone doing? Two. But uh, okay. But you can have your own design, so it doesn't matter as long as it flies. Great. So. <clears throat> Be creative. So you've all got your plane? So that's the play. Now the second step is um, participate. So what I'd like you to do on the plane, write down your idea of how we should organize ESD conferences 
in ways that bring the heart and the soul to what we say, sorry for mistake, that are more connected to real life, the experience and practice of ESD. So what is it that you are missing or what is it that you could do that brings in this ESD practice and experience into this conference? And I'd like, some, I'd like specific ideas, so don't just say we need to talk less because that's not really helpful. So come up with, from your own practice, what do you as a researcher or as, a, or as, an, ed, or as an educator, what, can you, what do you know that you could do or that we should do to make these conferences more lived and more experiential? So that's, you, can, you get to write that down, you can write that down now, or you can just brew on it for a little while and, and write it down later. Because once you've written it down, you get to disrupt. You throw your paper airplane. You can either throw it to the front or to the side, but you get to disrupt this setting by throwing your airplane. And then finally, you get to decide. So if you like the idea, keep on flying the airplane. Just keep on passing it round. If you don't like the idea, keep it, hide it, eat it, or sit on it. Just make sure that it, it, it's not flying anymore. And then we should end up with the best ideas here at the front. So play, participate, disrupt, and decide. And this is also a really good opportunity if you had your eye on somebody to send them secret messages, just <laughs> making sure you get that as well. Great. Okay, so you can do this the whole time. Just keep on disrupting. If you get more ideas, keep on sending them. And I'll just talk through. I'll give some... While you're disrupting, I'll just keep on talking. Um, I'll give two examples of my own practice that I've been working on. So I work as an artist in communities. And the first one was taking place in a village nearby where I live. <laughs> See, this is way more interesting than I am. It's great. I'm going to go. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to keep on talking. Whatever you want to do, you can do. Um, so the first example I want to give um, was called Locative Meaning Making. It was a, an art piece I made in a village near by my hometown in Cornwall. And um, they were wanting to develop a quarry into something that was sustainable. So I was working with transition towns and they were interested to, to gather the ideas of people, their opinions of what um, the quarry should be. So I asked people to take me for a walk and bring an object that somehow represented for them what they thought the future of the town or the village should be. So this is a, a, a picture of a farmer and his family. And he said, the future for me is my children because they're going to take over the farm. So for him, farming was an important element in the area. So I asked people to take me to, for a walk and explain their view on the future of the place, what they wanted the place to be by, taking, by bringing an object. Then uh, this is another object that somebody brought. He brought some um, bits of granite make in, made into little cubes. And um, he said, because there's lots of granite, the quarry is obviously, is, they're, they're taking granite out of there, but it's not viable anymore. And he said, we need to find different ways of making a resource 
uh, we have to reinvent how we use a resource to make to give it added value. So he was really focusing on sort of the economic side of what the place could be. And while I was walking, I recorded all these stories. So I walked with about 20 different people and I recorded all the stories that they were telling me. And then I wanted to create an audio piece that had all those different stories in there. But that I, what I thought was really important is that they somehow related back to the place that, um, that the, the story was sort of conceived in. So this is a map of, of the town. So um, I, we sort of crossed all those areas. And this is a, a, a picture of the program that I was using. So all of these pieces are different perspectives of people on what they think the future of that place should be. And I started organizing them to have to show how people have very different perspectives on what their community is, what they think the past was, what they think the future is. And by putting them together, creating new stories of those different perspectives, but at the same time trying to put them back in the landscape that they relate to. So these are stories that were conceived by w walking with people, um, but at the same time they very much relate to specific places in the landscape. And then I invited people to listen to the audio. So they were listening to the stories of their fellow uh, community members, their neighbors and friends and families. They were listening to all these different stories and perspectives of people about what they think sustainability is in the place that they live. And I'll just play a little excerpt of that. Is there sound? During the Jubilee, I invited the people from Constantine to go for a walk while listening to the narratives of fellow villagers. I guided them along the footpaths, and the walk ended at a huge pile of granite blocks next to a stream in the middle of the woods. There we had tea and a chat about the stories and the views featured in the audio piece, their own perspectives on the environment, how the past informed the future, and what they imagined for the times to come. Take out your tea and let's have a cup of tea. Good point. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Good 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 it was very interesting hearing the different generations talking, wasn't it? Mm. The youngest ones who just view the woods as a playground. A wonderful playground, mm. but a playground. And then the really old ones who kind of remembered it as a working place. What a nice treat. You didn't know we've got the tea. Yeah. Oh, it's a tea. You might just you press the middle of this. I yeah. think so, yeah. I think everybody wants. I'll just start yes, pouring it out, shall I? Thanks, Mum. <laughs> <laughs> And we also were in the tape because we were listening to it. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. We were part of history as well. So you felt that continuity, which I never, I've never felt before. Oh, one time I was finding it a bit depressing. When was that? Well, about the farming no longer being economic and and uh, quarries are no longer economic and wondering what would happen in the future. And then there was the guy at the end saying, mm. maybe, there's, maybe there's a better future ahead of us and we'll get things right. Mm. And maybe we will. But mostly you're looking back and thinking that the past was better than the present, but your tape made you feel that it's all one. Con continuum. Mm -hmm. Things change. I was interested. Somebody was saying about us being self-sufficient on a, lo a local power station, and 
you didn't, you didn't hear that bit. Yeah. About, yeah, either be wind, solar, or sea, and we might have the mm. energy, you know. It, it, I mean, yeah, I mean, the bit I bridled at mm. the was uh, they didn't want it on their doorstep. No, we didn't want the concept. <laughs> the concept you know, was No, somebody broad. did go but on to say that. that. But then, yeah, yeah, but then they actually made, uh, yeah, 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 that's good. Oh, yeah. Very, very connected to the place and to the past in this place. Just, just that little experience is enough to make you feel, well, I'm coming through as well, and maybe I won't stay very long, but it, I'm still part of it. And that's a really, it's really a nice feeling, yeah. Yeah, I know. This made me imagine what it, what it was like and how it was to live like that. Way back, so let's. What's the time? Oh, I didn't die that bad straight. Go on. Put the cooker on. Warm the oven up. Duck leg. Tonight, I buy them in two in a pack, and I separate them, and one will do me, you know. Then I have Aunt Bessie's potatoes. Do you know they do? Aunt Bessie's potatoes? Oh, handsome they are. They're in, uh, you know, frozen. And uh, you just put them in the oven and cook them for 25 minutes. Oh, that's pretty handsome here. And I'd do that, and then I'd do me frozen veg, the green broccoli, and a bit of white broccoli, cauliflower. Right, so that was um, Storms and Water, the, the piece that I did. And what, what I thought was really important from, what I learned from it was that everyone, like I said, everyone is an, is an expert in living. And if you start with the stories of people and you, oh, hang on. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, if you start... If you, if you just ask the question to people, what do you think is important where you live and where do you want to go from here? People have loads of stories and they have opinions. And as soon as you start listening to them, as soon as you start bringing them together, then that, start, that starts is a, is a starting point to have more complex conversations about how to, do you think we should get there. But people that live in a place usually love the place where they live and they want to talk about it and they want it to be good for their children. So it's about finding what questions, what invitations can you give people so that they start thinking about this really complex things of sustainable development. If you just ask them, what, do you, what, do you, what is sustainable for you, they, they will not... Um, it's not an in inviting question. It doesn't inspire them to think about what they really want to say. So it's constantly finding the right questions and invitations to do that. And the other thing, so the other project that I'd like to talk about where I used a similar sort of approach uh, happened just the past five weeks. So um, it started at the beginning of March and last Saturday, so six days ago we had a performance so this is really fresh and it was called storm songs um because two well year and a half ago in uh, february 2014 we had massive storms um in all of england but i live in cornwall so that's the very west tip and that's where the big seas just hit first 
So a lot of the coastal villages were completely um, swamped, well, just flooded in water. This is a picture of Port Leven, which is near to where I live. And, uh, well, you can see the, the tower. So there was, two, there was just a whole sequence of storm, and each one was bigger than the one before, and each one hit a harbour that was already hit lots and lots of times. This was Valentine's Day 2014. And what happened is uh, that the fisher boats in the harbour um, started sinking. So you can see, well, you can't see it on this picture, but there's basically, there's like a, a harbour mouth. And once the, when, when the waves are big, they put down big bits of wood. And for the first time in living memory, the, the bits of wood were broken. So suddenly you had enormous bulks circling in the harbour and just hitting all the boats. So there was about 10 boats that sank. But because of it, they, what, what was happening is that the community came together and they started lifting out the boats from the harbour. So there was fishing fishermen holding on to their boats, getting onto their boats. There was people cooking for the men that were working. Farmers came down from all around the area with tractors and started pulling out boats from the harbour and putting, getting them to safety. So I thought, um, I started working with Exeter University uh, because they were doing a project around coastal resilience. And I thought that this the fact that this happened and it was so fresh in people's memories uh, about the storms actually was a good starting point to talk about what will we do if these things are going to be recurring, thing, recurring events, if um, through climate change we'll have more extreme weather. So what can we learn from what happened in that community that other communities can also do once extreme weather becomes something that is more and more frequent. So again, it was about translating, not asking people, what do you think we should do about climate change, but seeing what is really alive in this community at the moment. What are they proud of? What, what are they, um, well, what are they afraid of as well? And, and what can we learn from something that just happened? So it's not an issue only in that village. Um, actually, the whole coast of Cornwall is, well, actually, England is just getting smaller and smaller everywhere. So the, the, the cliffs are crumbling, and uh, the, the National Trust, that's the big nature organization in England, is very well worried because they constantly have to move the paths back. They have to make sure that people are safe that use the cliffs. And some harbors, are just too expensive to keep on repairing every year. So we are losing heritage, but also people are losing their livelihoods through these storms. So the project that I did, um, I started again, started walking with people in, in the village. So this is Trish. She uh, was born uh, as a farmer's daughter and then married a fisherman and came and lived it and started to live in the village. And I asked her to take me to four places in, in the town. Uh, one place that reflected her relationship to the sea. One place that showed how Port Leven has been shaped by the sea. One place that uh, shows the, how, how the, a community can weather a storm. So how a community can be resilient. And one place, what was the fourth one? Relationship C. Oh yeah, one place that ha somehow held a memory of last year's storms. So we just walked and she talked. She told me stories about where she was from, about the community. And then we started talking about how does so from talking about how does Port Leven weather a storm, we also talked about how does she in her personal life weather a storm. So she had just lo lost her husband a year before, and we talked about what is it, what is it to weather a storm? And it, is there anything that we can learn from that that also transposes to communities? This is Julia, same thing, I asked her to take me for a walk. She took me to her garden that she built herself, 
and she explained me about this particular plant. I can't remember the name in Latin, I'm really sorry. Um, that basically, uh, she tested loads and loads of plants that would be, that weather a storm, because there's all these winds coming from the sea. And this was the only one that could sustain those storms. So she planted them into windbreaks, and this helped other, other plants to grow. So again, we talked about, we used that as a metaphor. What does this plant have that we might be able to use in communities as well? What is it, how does it, how does it weather these storms? And Greg, um, a National Trust ranger, he took, me, he took me on a walk all along the coast and um, told me about his experiences or what he saw during, during the storm, where he said like the, the harbour was one big sort of chocolate brownie mass circling with the boats going in circles and the, and, and the water just rushing in and out through that harbour. And he also talked about how, as a National Trust ranger, they've sort of, um, their attitude is that they've, they've given up the battle with the sea. So they said, well, we're not going to win it anyway. Um, so all we do is managed retreat. So every time that the cliff path falls down the cliff again, because the, the sea has eaten the, the path, he'll just move it back again. And every time when... Um, they, uh, they've deposited stones to reinforce a certain bed and they get washed away. They just put new stones up. So that is their attitude towards the sea. They've lost it or they've lost that battle. They're not fighting it anymore. And then with all these stories, um, we started to create songs. So Cornwall has a very strong singing tradition. So you had uh, fishermen singing sea shanties. These are working songs about the work that they do, about their activities. There's loads and loads of choirs in Cornwall. And we thought, well, uh, let's create new songs about our current contemporary relationship with the sea. So a lot of the, sea, the songs in Cornwall are, are about men going into sea and battling and ships and sinking and coming back and having the catch and sharing the catch with the community. So what are these, what songs would we sing now if we sing about our relationship with the sea? And uh, we gathered people uh, from, the, from the community and um, uh, local singers, musicians, uh, the Porth Levin Ladies Choir, so that was the lady, the, the, the people that sing in the church. And we worked with a Cornish composer and a Dutch composer, and she brought in like the traditional uh, tunes and melodies, and he brought in more experimental ways of working with choirs to see can we catch a feeling of sea or a feeling of storm. And we rehearsed for about... Um, 10, 10 rehearsals and um, we created seven new pieces, one of which is a sea shanty, so it's an existing melody but we, trans we, we um, changed the lyrics, so we wrote lyrics with residents and the singers, all reflecting our relationship with the sea and how we how we build the path, how the sea takes it away again, so we build it again, how we, uh, every day we go to work and then something happens and we go to work again, how uh, we take out the boats in the winter and then we put them back in the summer, sort of the re repetitive actions that we do in response to nature. And another piece that, um, where people stepped forward and, and shared some of their experiences of the storm. So this was all to gather stories and to engage a larger audience to think about um, these issues of community and storm. But in a way that was there, so it was entirely based on, on what they had said. And I'll show you a little video that is a first cut, so please be generous. Um, I just get, I got it in yesterday, so I thought I should show you. Sound, is that okay? Okay, some of you have it. Oh, oh, hang on. Oh, what? what is this? I can't. 
It was very interesting it. hearing the different but generations. But first, turn this one. Mm. The youngest ones who just viewed the woods as a playground. A wonderful playground. We had turned the view off. And then the really old ones who... Well, no, no, turn that off. Working. And that's here. There we go. Songs was a collaboration between uh, Vijf de Quartier, a Dutch theatre company, and Encounters Arts, an arts organisation in Devon. And we've been working over the past month collecting stories of Port Leveners about last year's storms and their relationship to the sea in general and how a coastal community weathers a storm. And we've translated those stories into song. I walked down to the harbour, all around me, fragments of boats and debris strewn everywhere. On my return to Port Leather, it was devastation in the harbour with boats tossed everywhere. But there was people, there were tractors pulling the boats from the harbour. a Cornish composer and a Dutch composer, bringing traditional Cornish tunes into the project, using new lyrics and creating new sound pieces that represent the feeling of sea, the feeling of storm. Port Lavin typically is one of the highest wave energy environments in the world. Last year there were two significant storm events. That's the first time I've known the box to be smashed open. The level of devastation, there were boats sunk and boats smashed up, people lost their livelihoods. The whole community rallied around and done a big clean-up operation. There was fishermen that had no nets left, they had no boats. We as a community, we rallied, we done fundraising events, all the clubs, all the little groups within Port Flevin that can generally sit within isolation of each other but all working towards the same cause of we love living in Port Leven all rallied around and all pulled together so it was fantastic and there was significant amounts of money raised for the Port Leven Fishermen's Association which helped rechain the harbour provide new nets for the fishermen and basically get our, our fishing fleet back on its feet again and the harbour operational so the box were reinstalled and yeah it, it was a real of everyone through the community and all differences were put aside. In my lifetime the sea levels have risen here definitely there's there's absolutely no two ways about that. With the increase in storms that we've been seeing recently it, it's crucial that, that we understand how, how we can live with the world that's evolving around us as, as uh, time moves forwards. The project was interested to see what, what are these elements in communities that help us weather a storm. The storm waves they across the shore and new key to Port Leven. If extreme weather events are going to be more frequent, then we can learn from what Port Leven did last year. Traditional songs and modernise them to fit 
with current events, which I think is what sea shanties are about, is, is about keeping the time alive. New things are happening, so we need to update them and carry on the story for other people to hear. The stories and songs that have come out of this and just people's experiences, if this happens again, everyone will know that, yes, it's a disaster and it's a very bad thing that's happened, but it was okay last time in the end, so hopefully we'll be able to fix something again and carry the on. The tower watch the grainy sea, it's seen it all before. Right. There's a line about me and the song and the, the work that we've done. It's always good to to feel that people appreciate what you've been doing. Uh, in recent times, obviously, taking into effect climate change and the way things are moving, it's more looking at the, the coastal battle as, as being over, and it's more managed retreat at the moment. Um, so we know that it's going to erode, and as opposed to trying to stop uh, the sea doing that, we just manage it when it happens. All about remembering what's happened and then passing those memories on, as opposed to just the physical damage, people's thoughts and experiences of it. And, yeah, I suppose through the arts and singing and breaking it down into shanties, it's one of the it's one of the most popular and Cornish ways to pass those stories on. Coastal resilience or the resilience of uh, Cornish communities is, is not something that takes place only in town councils. It takes place in the hearts of communities. It's the lives of real people that live somewhere. Storm Songs really wanted to bring those experiences and stories uh, to the forefront. We think that translating them into song engage an audience to think about these issues that they might not normally think about. Oh, can you do it again? Sorry. <laughs> uh, so, just to end with, um, oops, not to end. Okay, I'll do it without the slide. So, to um, just talk about a few things, what, what are the cores of these things? It's about making sure that you, um, you, you work with the place that you are. So, whatever the concept is, it has to have a meaning, a located meaning in a place. In my opinion, that's the only way that things can be experienced and lived, and that it's the only way that we can start working with people and talking about complex issues. And um, another thing to say is, of course, these are, these are arts projects, but arts is not about just painting or sculpting. It's um, about making meaning, and in that sense, we are all artists. We are. We should all be actors and meaning makers in this world, not just spectators of uh, of issues. And as teachers, I think we're artists as well because we constantly create and we we think about how how can we make sure that we make other people think about issues, and that's what arts tries to do as well. So let's see a few of these. Have more discussions outside the typical setting, outdoors, visiting different places. Any good ones up there that you want to pass on? Debate picnics, debate picnics like that, in small groups, eight people outside in the nature. Bring children to the conference, ask their opinion, what they like to do, change. We should have hands-on workshop. I've actually always thought about it, why we all talk about students and learning, not with them during the conferences. Longer workshops where you actually participate in something else program. Sharing of ideas is much more meaningful this way, at least partly outdoors. This works at least to workshops. Good one, somebody else wrote. Outdoors, outdoors. Yeah. That right. Um, we've got loads more. Um, I'll just, I'll pin them. I'll just lay them out here. So if you want to see them, you can come forward and see them. And then I'll finish. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie.
Lauritz, 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 please, we have questions. Thank you for uh, this inspirational presentation, what you had, and uh, I must say I, I, I very much like agree what you were saying, that um, my own personal passion is actually uh, community development in a sense that uh, um, finding this deeper connection between people again who sometimes are a little bit alienated and, and um, creating this strength. But uh, I would like to point out something that you started with. You, you said that uh, giving meaning to what we do and also to, to the words what we do. And then you said that um, let's make planes. And yet you didn't trust us with our experience, knowledge, mm -hmm. and creativity mm -hmm. to, to make the plane ourselves, ah, okay. but you invited an expert. <laughs> so you didn't ditch the expert yourself. <laughs> I invited in another one. <laughs> so what, what created the effect that, that I, I actually didn't make the aeroplane. I was mm. looking at the audience, how they followed the expert. And I guess most of, of us did the plane as Marek showed, which was excellent aeroplane. Mm -hmm. but not every individual one. And that made me think that uh, I think sustainability is about balance. And sometimes we need an expert, Marek, mm -hmm. for instance. I think we couldn't do the conference without him. So uh, that was a very good learning experience, mm -hmm. what we do and uh, what we tell our students to do. And, mm -hmm. and uh, as you said, we are all guilty of making mistakes. But I think it's good that mm -hmm. we can see that, okay, maybe we need an expert sometime. Yeah. A little bit. Well, I think that is very true. I hadn't realized that, and that's interesting. Um, also, when you actually started throwing your airplanes, I realized I couldn't talk anymore. So that was quite problematic because that's what I was supposed to do. So I had a bit of a, okay, what am I doing? Shall I go? No, that'd be a bit. And then you and Marek was like, no, go on. I was like, okay, I'll talk. But there was something else happening as well. And I think that's, that is an important thing to think about. So if you do open up a space, then you have to be ready that things are not going to go the way you had planned them to go, even if you plan to open up the space and you allow things to take over, then, yeah, that means that you're not in control anymore. So it is good, isn't it? Yeah. But, yeah, so I didn't know what to do. <laughs> yeah, thank, you. thank you for that presentation. And uh, as you yourself pointed out, uh, several methods like uh, storytelling, making songs, but also the conference is a method. But by the end of the day, it, what really matters is how we deliver uh, sustainability, what happens, uh, what, what is the change that we discussed yesterday, and how to make this change. And uh, the change makers are the people, but also by the end of the day, the decision makers. Mm -hmm. So my question is, what happened to this quarry? What was the influence of this storytelling to mm. the actual final decision on that? Whether there is something that we could learn and mm -hmm. practice, or uh, still there are formal procedures, formal decision-making points uh, that have very little space for, for mm. interference and uh, making this change that comes from the people, from the community. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, well, in terms of the quarry, um, the, the community has been in a process of buying that entire, the woods and the quarry, um, so they can, it can be community owned, so that is a structural thing where policy allows for that to happen, so you do have to have those structures in place for people to be able to, to take things in their own hand. But what what I'm trying to do with these projects, and it was less so in, in, in the quarry project, and it's going to be in the storm songs because it's going to continue, is to bring all those different groups together. So to make sure that if storm songs is going to continue, I'll be working with policymakers as well. And once you have those different people 
in a space together where they usually work separately and you all ask them the same question about what do you want this place to be, then I think there's more opening for conversation and, and to actually change maybe policies that are um, a, a sort of um, impacting communities' abilities to, to shape the place where they live. So it would be very much bringing them together and then seeing can we change the policy structures that allow people to take um, to shape their environments. Does that answer? More or less? Yeah, okay. Uh, we have one suit. Can I ask you a question? Um, did you, do you agree or was it like, is there anybody, really please be honest, that thinks that this was complete and utter bullshit? <laughs> I'm really interested. No. <laughs> I, I really enjoyed it. I really did enjoy it. Uh, it was an alternative look at a situation that I'm very close to because I live just up the road. Mm -hmm. So I understand um, the very uniqueness of, of that particular locality and I understand the challenges. If there was something I would comment on is I would like to see yourself as the role of the academic in this is to help draw out from that experience the sort of frames, the sorts of key things that can be shared beyond that experience. Because I think the role of an academic and, and certainly the role of yourself as, as, a, as a, I understand you as a research project is, is to support and change but also to draw that out mm. so that others can learn from it. So, it would be really interesting to have some articulation of, of what, from that experience, others can take away. Okay. Um, that would exactly go against the grain of what these things try to do. So the only frame for these things is look at the place and see what, what kind of unique approach do I have to follow here in order to make things happen. And what academia tries to do is to abstract the learning points, the, the best practices, so that they can be copied into something else. I would disagree. I think that that's a very narrow view of academia. I mean, my PhD research was a grounded approach, mm -hmm. where I completely ignored all theories and thinking and stemmed it from the ground. But then, you know, it, 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 it's almost selfish to think that only those involved are going to learn from it. I mean, the key role of researchers is actually to, to, yes, of course, make an impact locally, but also really understand how others can learn from your methodology, mm -hmm. can learn from your way of working. And some of that would have been really, really interesting. Mm. So we can chat later, maybe. Yeah, it'd be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Maybe a short question. Oh. Is it my turn? Yes. Yes. yes please. Great. We didn't get many aeroplanes back here. Oh. Aeroplanes don't fly uphill. Um, I'm sorry. I, I really enjoyed that bit. Um, I really appreciated uh, the sense of chaotic play that you brought in to disrupt my state of mind, um, which was very much connected and linked to the concreteness of the place in which we are. Um, however, I also felt a little harangued at the beginning. And um, in the project that I've been running in schools, which brings lots of creative approaches into um, schools and education spaces, um, I've sometimes felt that teachers really receive so much criticism mm -hmm. in uh, an educational space that they're, they're often always you know expected to know the answers and to have the right answers um, and of course the right answers for one set of people is never the right answers for anybody else and what my sustainability is is not your sustainability mm -hmm. okay but we're actually expected to know what sustainability is because we are supposed to teach it. So we are positioned professionally 
I find, in a very challenging space. Um, and I have found that to, to bring um, a modeling way into schools where I am acknowledging the wisdom of the teachers and professionals around me first and drawing from that and then moving gently with that and working with that is one way to encourage that courage, courageous step that you know, is helpful for them to bring into this particular subject area. Mm -hmm. So connecting with loving myself as a professional and being loved for me was a very important part of the expertise that I took into schools that I worked with. Mm -hmm. So you become an expert in listening and um, opening a space up for others. Is that what you're saying? You're not necessarily an expert in knowing what sustainability is. You're an expert in starting the conversation and, and allowing other people to share their view of it. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I'm not an expert, actually. I'm just person to person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm just a person first. Yeah. Yeah. I'm you. a human being. Exactly. A human being. Yeah. Thank you. Arjen, very briefly. Very briefly. Um, I want to, first I want to, to, to say that all the things you mentioned at the very beginning, um, I think you gave it meaning in, through your stories. So I, I appreciate that because I do, I think if I would analyze it and, and contrast or connect the terms that you listed at the beginning, I think all of them were in your presentation in a, in a very meaningful way. The, the second, uh, the co I mean, Daniela has a point, of course, that we should be able to learn from that beyond the situation in which the meaning was created. And I think as I, as I listen to the stories, and I think most of us, as we listen to them, we, we do make meaning out of them. Mm -hmm. They resonate in certain ways and maybe not in others. So in some ways, we, it's like a case or story, general, self-generalized or inspired generalization. It's a different kind of generalization in the sense that we take from this a kind of a model or yeah. prescription what we should do or best do. Although there are some ideas in there that I think could be, there are some spaces that you open up and we could learn from how to open up these spaces that we can do elsewhere in the world, mm -hmm. I think. So in that sense, I appreciate yeah. uh, that. I think, I think it also relates to it's a difference between making those learnings extremely explicit. So first showing the story and then saying, right, so these are the bullet points of the things that you should take out of it. It's about showing the story and then just allowing the meaning making to happen with you here. Because I can, yeah, I can give a framework, but that might not be the framework that you take out of it. So, okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. And, uh, Thank you. <laughs> something, something for all of us to learn is uh, the art of asking simple questions.